Welcome back. If people could um, get back to their desks and chairs, would be helpful. Turn on the cameras. Miss Brave Boy, are you there? Can you hear me? Barely. Really? Maybe that's my end. Can other people hear her okay? Can everyone hear me okay? That's better. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> good morning. Okay, good, good morning. Um, our next topic for discussion is welfare fraud prosecutions. Uh, before our panel begins, we'll hear a short overview of the CalFresh program from Andrea Brayboy, Chief of the CalFresh and Nutrition Branch of the California Department of Social Services. She is, are you, yes, I see Ms. Bauer, Brower. She's here with Kimberly Brower, Section Chief of DSS's Data Stewardship and Integrity Bureau. Ms. Brayboy, take it away. Hi, good morning. Thank you for inviting me um, to this interesting discussion. I was, however, pinged by my baby sister to say hello to Prosecutor Herbert. Um, she is one of his former prosecutors there in the city of Long Beach before she moved to Pasadena. I am the eldest of the three Taylor sisters. So I want to make sure that I got that out of the way so I don't lie to her and say that I didn't say hello. Okay. Um, again, we'll note that in the minutes. <laughs> so for, from being Jamia Taylor's oldest sister, I am Andrea Braveboy, as you said, chief of CalPresh and Nutrition. And um, I'm here again, as you mentioned, with Kimberly Brower, who's going to provide some support um, in regards to this space. I see that I am kind of the bridge from the earlier discussion to the latter discussion. So as I reviewed your staff mem memorandum, which was put together excellent, I want to focus on some key points in there as I bring that in, and then we bring in our data and then uh, kind of connect the dots to any questions you may have. Uh, so first and foremost, I do want to highlight a slight um, not a correction um, on page two, stating that CDSS administers uh, Medi-Cal. We do not. We administer CalWorks and CalFresh. So my conversation here will predominantly be with those programs. The Department of Healthcare Services is the oversight agency for Medi-Cal. So I did want to give that point of clarity before we started. So again, with CalWorks, I want to specify that our current caseload in CalWorks statewide is a little bit over 300,000. We're at roughly around 322,000. That's as of April 2023. And just as a description of the program, CalWORKS is California's version of the federal TANF program um, and provides temporary cash assistance to meet basic family needs. It also provides education, employment and training programs and supportive services, ancillary services, to give families opportunities to build resilience and achieve critical economic mobility. Um, and some of those ancillary services are things such as bus passes, uh, gas cards, and childcare. Components of CalWORKS include time limits on eligibility, uh, work and work-like requirements, which is important, wraparound services to encourage program participation, and coaching case management to help parents meet their goals. So eligibility here. Um, for the CalWORKS program, it's a means-tested program, and to meet eligibility requirements, families must demonstrate economic hardship by way of income and asset tests. In addition, children, so the, the eligibility comes through the children here for CalWORKS. Children must be deprived of parental support and care due to underemployment of the primary wage earner or the incapacity, death, or absence of a parent. A uh, person's fleeing to avoid prosecution, custody, or confinement after conviction of a felony are not eligible to CalWORKS. So then let's skip down to CalFresh. Our current caseload as of April 2023 is a little bit over 2.7 million households and roughly contains 4.7 eligible persons. So CalFresh is California's version of the federal SNAP program, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It is an entitlement program that provides eligible households 
federally funded monthly benefits to, to purchase the food needed to maintain adequate nutrition. And we have a state version of that called the California Food Assistance Program, which provides benefits to eligible non-citizens that meet a particular CalFresh eligibility criteria, except for the fact that they, of their immigration status. So who would that be? That would be lawfully present persons under five years, some asylees um, and uh, other individuals in that nature. Um, but that does not expand to undocumented persons yet. We are moving in that direction as of October, 2025. Um, to be eligible for CalFresh, legally present non-citizens must have been in the country for five years, either disabled, a member of a certain refugee community under the age of 18 or over the age of 59, and the CFAP serves all other legally present non-citizens. Benefits can be used to purchase most foods and food products for human consumption. That includes seeds for farming um, and agriculture. Benefits may not be used for items such as alcoholic beverages, cigarettes, and paper products. The program is administered on the federal level by the United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA. We, the CDSS, are the state oversight in, um, agency, but then we are considered in California a county administered state, which is gonna be interesting in your future discussions as you go through this. Every county then administers CalFresh within their own region. And that's where we get into the nuances of various interpretations and applications of your discussion moving forward. Uh, CalFresh is issued via an EBT card, and cardholders can use that uh, through a point of sale terminal at various FNS authorized retailers. So, in order to participate in CalFresh, eligibility is based on certain income standards in the state of California. We have pretty much abolished the asset requirement. Um, there's a few cases in there that require an asset test. For the most part, it's based on income eligibility. And that income eligibility is under 200% of the federal poverty limit. Um, there are ex exceptions to that. We do categorize uh, different households based on disability and age. If you meet elderly and disabled household criteria, there are different income um, limits for you in that aspect. So that's a brief overview of the programs. Now, I wanna take you to your document on page five. And I found this quite interesting. So I wanted to do a slight discussion here. Um, and it says specifically, while applicants are warned that omissions or represent, misrepresentations made on these forms can result in prosecution, reporting requirements can be difficult to follow, especially for the many people receiving aid that are dealing with the additional stress of food and housing insecurity. And that is very true. And then it goes on to um, highlight a uh, finding from uh, PPIC stating that uh, employment patterns, fluctuating income, um, oftentimes uh, provides challenges to um, reporting requirements. I do wanna highlight here and put a pin here um, in regards to our programs that back in 2013, we changed reporting criteria. We put in a waiver to change from quarterly reporting, which had many uh, reporting requirements mid quarter to what's called simplified reporting. We call it here in the state of California, semi-annual reporting. So what does that mean? Once a person or an applicant is certified for benefits, they will not recertify for another year, 12 months. That's the standard certification period. Within the six month period, they provide a semi-annual report. Um, it's a periodic report. They update information such as income, household composition, um, and then other reporting requirements there. Between those six months, we reduced the number of mandatory reporting requirements. So this is important. So for the CalWORKs uh, program, mandatory reporting requirements that must be made within 10 days of the change include fleeing felon status, violation of conditions of probation or parole, address changes, and any income newly received that exceeds the income reporting threshold. We call that IRT. Okay, and IRT is a set number. In CalWORKs, it's a sliding scale. Let, let me correct that. In CalWORKs, it's a sliding scale based on the income that they already receive. So it could change. 
Um, but they are given that information once certified or recertified. This is your IRT. If you receive income uh, that exceeds that number, then you have 10 days to report that. Now, in CalFresh, we have fewer mandatory reports. So all of those that you just heard were specific to CalWORKs. In CalFresh, we only have three. That is IRT, again, which is a standard number. It does not fluctuate. We have what's called an able body adult without dependents, ABODs. Um, and they need to report if you're designated an ABOD, you need to report if you're working less than 20 hours a week. The requirement for an ABOD to receive benefits nationally is that they must work 20 hours a week and or 80 hours a month. However, California is currently in a waiver due to the pandemic and our unemployment rates. We were able to apply for a waiver for two years. So our ABOD time limit will not be imposed. We hope it won't be imposed, but if it does go back into effect, it won't be until November 1st of 2024. The third and final mandatory report is gambling and lottery winnings. If you win um, in one sitting of a game, gambling or lottery winnings that total more than 3,500, I believe, then you have to report that within 10 days. These are the mandatory reports. Now, anything else in CalFresh, now I'm speaking directly for CalFresh, that changes in that household does not have to report it unless it's on the periodic report at six months and or at recertification. Yeah, I just want to keep us on time. I really appreciate all this information. I think it's and it, it's obviously in a ton to manage and a ton to understand that I think creates part. It's 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 understandable how people were just or who are first of all administering it. Thank you, but um, the legislature and the recipients. It's it's a very intricate, complicated system. Um, to keep us on time and to keep our, our focus, which is really about the criminal implications of violations of the rules that you've been describing. I was wondering if you just you see this as a significant issue for the administration of CalFresh, the fraud that people may be um, perpetrating against the system in order to get it extra benefits. Do you, you see this as a significant problem or not? And if so, where 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 do you see the problem? Well, I find that question interesting based on the data that you provided within um, your spreadsheet. But I want to say that um, some of that, the answer to your question is unknown at this point, because in the pandemic, we had some flexibilities on reporting requirements, not necessarily reporting, but how the staff on the county level um, provide that information. Um, we did have an opportunity to waive interviews so we can get people that were impacted based on losing their jobs and the economic downturn to get on faster. And so those telephone interviews were waived. Why is that important? Because it removed the opportunity for these conversations to happen where we were clearly stating what those reporting requirements are. So I think we'll definitely be able to get an answer to that post pandemic to see if there are any increase or changes in the data that you provided here. But no, obviously it's all prosecutions go way down, perhaps pre-pandemic pre -pandemic, or perhaps your colleagues in other states or places, do you see fraud as a problem? Or is it, because it does seem to be going way down or at least prosecutions and arrests seem to be going way down. That may, may be for a million different reasons, but I was just wondering if, this, if you see this as a significant issue. This is where I'm gonna lean in on my partner here who okay. actually sees the statewide fraud. Hey, I'll jump in. So, I mean, is it a significant issue? It's 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 not a issue that is, it's not a huge issue, but is integrity in our programs something we're concerned about always? And so, uh, you know, I, I would put it that way. Um, with the flexibilities that happened during the pandemic, prosecutions and stuff that you'll see those numbers go down because of certain rule changes that happen. But is there fraud in the programs? Absolutely. And that's why we have our county um, special investigative units that um, investigate these and decide whether they need to move forward with criminal prosecution or through our um, administrative uh, process. So is, you know, is it a problem overall? It's something, yes, that does need to be looked into. And that's why we have the teams that do that in the county. 
But it sounds like you're saying it's not a rampant out of control problem that is me. Um, rampant out of control. I'm sorry. I don't, mean to, I, don't, I don't. I don't mean to make you characterize. I, of course, <laughs> of course, you're um, want to maintain the integrity of the system. Nobody wants to have um, uh, cheats or getting in inappropriate amount, amounts of money. You guys are handing out uh, benefits to literally millions of people. So you want to make sure that there's the resources to help the people who truly need it, um, which I completely understand. I don't mean to put you in an awkward position. Um, I'm just trying to try and get our arms around because it does seem like things are, you know, trending in the in the right direction. And I just wanted to make sure that, um, first of all, do you agree with that? I presume yes. Yes. Okay. And it's, it seems like that there's no particular area that you see um, needs particular um, focus of attention regarding fraud, or is there? Recipient fraud, no. Now there's the whole other issue of, you know, benefits being skimmed and stolen, which is rampant and kind of out of control. Um, and, stolen and, by, by whom? Um, these, so I guess the term that's used a lot is bad actors I call or perpetrator suspects are you putting skimming devices on point of sale devices or ATMs, and then they're skimming because the um, EBT card does not have um, significant protections in place. Um, they, it's easy to get, they do the mag stripe. They get the information, they get the PIN number, and then they can go to the ATM at the beginning of the month and pull out the client's funds. And that's happening every month. Um, and thousands and thousands of, of, of clients are impacted with this. That's interesting. Kimberly, right. to be clear, that's, that's, uh, that's stealing that's being, stealing from people who are receiving benefits, right? Correct. We're not stealing from the state. No, but I mean, it is because Indir we indirectly, reimburse. Yes, in in indirect. I understand. I think I understand. Yeah, because we reimburse those the, the clients of their lost funds. Oh. Oh. Michael, can I, can I give a point of clarification here too, is that the difference um, here, when you say fraud, it's kind of difficult for us to interpret that, right? Because based on your previous discussion um, with the program, it's all based on the law enforcement officer and their determination. And then again, in the counties, it's all based on the DA and their determination, right? So we have what's considered an inadvertent household error, which is just human error, right? You missed a report or something happened, you, you, and that was simple and then it's corrected. So then you, you received more benefits than you should have with a short period of time. And then we have what we consider blatant fraud, right? Where you're based on your definition within the document that people continuously report misinformation in order to obtain benefits that they're not entitled to. So there's a slippery slope here. Got it. Assembly member Brian. Thank you, Chair Romano. Um, I, I heard you say that if you are on these benefits and you win $3,500 at a casino, you have to report that within five days. And, and I know that I think for just everybody, you have to report winnings, for example. But I think the threshold is like 10,000 for, for other people. So I'm wondering, is there a mismatch between kind of reporting you have to do receiving these benefits that could land you into trouble with the criminal legal system versus reporting that every, you know, everybody else would have to do? It seems like the, the standards at least are higher on that instance with casino winning reporting. But I'm wondering if there are other examples um, where, where it seems like we're putting additional constraints on folks who have the fewest amount of means and threatening their means because of it. Yes, yeah, so this was a, a previous federal administration rule that went into place back in 2019, 2020. Um, I apologize, it's, it's around there. Um, and the requirement is that those that are on CalFresh, so SNAP benefits, this is not a rule for CalWorks, um, this is specific specific to SNAP that if they have gambling or lottery winnings over that resource limit that they must report within 10 days and be immediately discontinued. So yes. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> I will note that it did get raised to 4350, I believe now. Um, but yeah. You mentioned, Andrea, the kind of steps that DSS has taken to ease or kind of make more simple some of the reporting requirements. Um, 
are do you think that the steps taken have have made it so that report like are, are is there still confusion do you still see confusion with reporting requirements and i know that you have experience being a aid worker in a county too what what type of roadblocks do people experience with reporting requirements and are the steps that dss took already have they um kind of rectified those issues are there are they still existing i think it's that we have one, we have workers that we call super workers now, and they're monitoring federal requirements for not only cash, food, but also medical all at the same time. And that's where the confusion comes into play from a staffing perspective. From a recipient perspective, perspective I could imagine that if I do receive both cash and food, when do I report what? right? Because they're not perfectly aligned with the same type of reporting requirements. And so I could see that based on our population and demographic, that causing confusion as well. So either they fall into a place where they're over-reporting or they're under-reporting. One of the other issues here is language access as well. Sometimes it's difficult for certain individuals and populations to receive the information that they clearly need on their notices because they are not considered a threshold language. And so we are also seeing increases in populations, especially in the administrative hearing space of certain populations that whose language aren't necessarily English as their primary language. So we're investigating that as well. So I think it's a combination of clear understanding and clearly being able to articulate it, as well as having staff that clearly can di differentiate between which program they're serving this household with at that particular moment. All right. Um, I'm sorry to, to, to jump in here. We have a whole panel to, to, to dig uh, into this further. Um, so Ms. Brayboy and Ms. Brower, if you would like to stay for that panel, because other questions may come up as we have that discussion, that would be helpful if you can. If you can't, I, I appreciate it. But I do want to introduce our, our panelists. We'll also dig into this issue, particularly the fraud piece, but it was very helpful to have that set up. Uh, <clears throat> so the folks that are joining us for this panel are Jeff Co uh, Chomri, if I'm, again, <clears throat> excuse any mispronunciation, who's Deputy Public Defender in uh, Alameda County, uh, Kamaria Henry, Managing Deputy District Attorney from Riverside County, uh, Antoinette Dozier, Senior Attorney from the Western Center of Law and Poverty, um, and John Martire, a president of the California Fraud Investigators Association. Mr. Torney, if that's pronouncing correctly, we'll begin with you. Oh, and I would before, excuse me, um, again, <clears throat> but I hope some of you have been able to see our prior panels. By far the most information, and best and most helpful information to the committee is done during the Q&A. So I'm going to, and if you have submitted anything or if the information has been covered, please let's move right to your recommendations because we're just going to keep it very strictly to five minutes tops for each presentation and then we will ask you questions. That would be most helpful. So Mr. Chorney, again, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, thank you. You did pronounce my name correctly. Can you guys give me a thumbs up to make sure you can hear my audio okay? Thank you. So my name is Jeff Chorney. I've been a public defender in Alameda County for about 12 years. I've handled all kinds of cases and trials from DUIs to murders. I represented dozens of people charged with welfare fraud in Alameda County. Every single one of those people was uh, charged with a felony. And I want to start my presentation today uh, by beginning with a short list. Um, hitting someone in the face, hitting and spitting on a police officer, hitting and injuring a spouse, a child, or another family member. And you're probably wondering why I'm bringing up this list. What is this crazy public defender doing? We're supposed to be talking about welfare fraud. Well, I'll tell you, those crimes that I'm listing are misdemeanors. The welfare fraud and the perjury that we're talking about today, those are felonies. Misdemeanors have less serious consequences than felonies. And I'm starting with this list because I want my presentation today to help you to focus on the purpose of the criminal legal system. And I want everyone to think about why we decide to put certain people in cages for certain things. And I'm gonna continue with my list very briefly. Sexual battery, possession of child pornography, vehicular manslaughter with gross negligence, 
I want to. I want to just cut you. I'm just going to cut you off for efficiency. We care a lot about who we lock up, and we are very aware of the difference between felonies and misdemeanors. So and, let's and, just let's just jump. To, so let I'm going to tell you, we care I, a lot about that. So if you could jump to that, that would be most helpful. I appreciate that. I'm just trying mm -hmm. to make the point that uh, all of those crimes that I've listed have less serious consequences we, than if we, one of we, my we understand. We understand how how important a felony conviction is, and I okay. understand that there are many crimes that may be misdemeanors or wobblers that have fallen different. So, how can we help address the problem? I think that we need to decriminalize <laughs> welfare fraud in California. I think that these prosecutions are unrealistic and unsustainable. Most of the prosecutions are against women, and I think that when someone goes on welfare from the beginning these people are treated as inherently untrustworthy and then that continues people have to fill out dozens of pieces of paper and then eventually they get charged with a felony for what i think are essentially paperwork mistakes i think that decriminalizing welfare will save money in the long run because we won't have to pay for the investigators the da's the judges myself my support staff and most importantly, I think that it needs to be decriminalized because the government already has ways of collecting this money that is called overpayment when someone gets too much money from the government through the administrative process and through small claims lawsuits, both of which are regularly happening in Alameda County. Those efforts are duplicative of what we're doing in the criminal courts. I think that by prosecuting these people, we are making enemies of them. We're teaching them to hate the process, hate the system, and we're doing it, we're creating this distrust and resentment to the most vulnerable population. Um, I'm almost finished, and I'm happy to, looking forward to uh, taking some questions, especially because you said that that was the most in, important part of this. Um, I just wanted to address one thing that was in Mr. Martier's letter, because he also talked about the administrative process. Because um, one of my main points is that this administrative process that people go through when they're accused of committing welfare fraud, this happens before they're criminally charged, um, it, it is very duplicative. And um, he said in his letter, that there are no that that can only happen while the person is still getting aid and that there are no penalties um, outside of that and i just want to make clear that everybody understands that actually what happens at those administrative hearings is that the debts are prosecuted and are then sent to county collection that means that when someone is charged with welfare fraud in a criminal case they have already most times been ordered to pay back the money and that debt sent to county collections. And I just don't see why it needs to be duplicative of that. And I address that in the paperwork that I filed. Um, and I just think it's a really important point because my clients are essentially getting prosecuted for something that not only they've already been ordered to pay back, but that the government already has the power to force them to pay back. That was your timer. It was perfect timing. Excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Henry. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me on the panel. My name is Kamaria Henry. I am a managing deputy district attorney for the Riverside County District Attorney's Office. I've been a prosecutor for 20 years, which I hesitate to say because then it ages me quite a bit. But uh, I have prosecuted welfare fraud as a trial attorney. I've also supervised our welfare fraud unit as a manager. Um, one of the things that I think is important for me to point out first and foremost is that I can only speak to what happens in Riverside County, but I know here in our county, our prosecutions focus only on persistent fraud. We do not prosecute paperwork mistakes or people who misspeak. That just is not something that we do in this county. 
uh, we focus on people who have um, who have violated the law for a matter of months or years to the tune of thousands and thousands of dollars. I understand that the minimum threshold for the felony theft is $950. It is rare that we prosecute a case that that involves that low amount of, I hesitate to say low, but low amount of theft. Um, we typically prosecute, as I indicated, cases in the thousands of dollars of loss. One of the reasons why I think it's important for us to continue as a prosecutorial, prosecutorial agency um, prosecuting welfare fraud is because there are simply just tools that we have at our disposal that are just not available in the administrative process. For example, we have discovery mechanisms that are unavailable administratively, such as subpoenas and search warrants. Um, without addressing the most notorious offenders, the most severe offenders, we are likely creating a disincentive for people to commit welfare fraud. Um, as I indicated, we in Riverside County pursue um, the worst offenders for our prosecutions and focus on those folks and organized criminal enterprises. Again, which is not uh, an area that the administrative process is equipped to handle. Um, we also are take very seriously the public's perception that is our it is our responsibility to prosecute fraud and to seek justice in these particular matters. So uh, I definitely think it's vitally important that we can continue our work. I recognize that our county may not prosecute. Uh, the way that other counties do. And I do think that prosecutorial discretion is extremely important in making sure that we are only focusing on exercising and seeking justice as opposed to merely just prosecuting because we are able to do so. Thank you very much. That was perfect timing. Antoinette Dozier, is, am I pronouncing your name correctly? You are, thank you. Um, I'm Antoinette, I'm a senior attorney with Western Center on Law and Poverty, where the last 13 years, my primary focus has been public benefits, economic security and access to justice issues. For over 50 years, Western Center has advocated on behalf of Californians experiencing poverty in every branch of government, from the courts to the legislature in the areas of health, housing, access to courts and public benefits. We are also a legal support center. So we provide technical support to the various legal aid organizations throughout the state that represent individuals. Um, California is an outlier among states and federal programs in prosecuting public benefits recipients. In California, public benefits recipients are more likely to be charged with fraud and prosecuted than folks who make comparable mistakes on their taxes or social security forms. The average U.S. taxpayer's odds of being punished for fraud are roughly 1 in 443,000, while a California public benefits recipient's odds of being punished for alleged fraud are 1 in 117. In most cases, the fraud are largely the result of human error, which should not be criminally prosecuted, but handled through the administrative process. Except in the rare cases of large scale fraud schemes, scams involving impersonations of public benefit staff, theft by public benefit staff, skimming or selling of benefits, schemes involving identity theft or incidents when benefits are received in multiple counties. I wanna highlight some of the demographics of our CalWORKs recipients. Um, according to the CDSS dashboard, among CalWORKs recipients across the state, 20% do not have a high school diploma, 45% of households pay more than 30% of their income in rent, 51% identify as Hispanic or Latino, two-thirds have a child under the age of six, so prosecuting these folks usually mean that we have minor children who may go into foster care. The vast majority have some earnings from work, which could be used to repay any public benefits overpayments, and we know that 50% of the national population reads below the sixth grade level, and that number is even higher for CalWORKs recipients. According to the California Budget and Policy Center, 86% of CalWORKs recipients are women, 
One in five have experienced domestic violence and nearly a third report mental health challenges. Under the current criminal scheme, we are unnecessarily criminalizing women of color with very young children in the home, immigrants, survivors of domestic violence, people with disabilities, and limited English proficient speakers. There's already a sufficient civil administrative process to determine responsibility for overpayments and disqualify someone from receiving further aid. And that process is overseen by ALJs who are well versed in the requirements of public benefits programs, which is not true for the, the criminal process. Um, people are often applying for aid at moments of crisis. They're given tens of pages of notices and rules at application when they may be uh, running to escape a domestic abuse situation, are facing homelessness, um, have very unstable income, and are applying at the, as the last result. Many have difficulty receiving mail or may be homeless. And some county inconsistent data matches are automatically referred to fraud investigations. Case workers are supposed to give the person a chance to clear up inconsistencies, and that often doesn't happen before fraud investigation is, is started. Counties can subpoena documents and witnesses for administrative hearings. The cumbersome and rigorous reporting process within the public benefits system um, traps many people. There's a reason why you saw it go down during COVID. That's because the reporting requirements changed and you didn't have these very complicated processes trapping people. Um, the rules require people to report semi-annually or annually, which means you're going to have many, many months of inadequate information if they inadvertently report by the very nature of the reporting rules of the program. Reporting rules require recipients to both look backward at income earned and forward to income that will be received. Um, it's For someone like you or I who have a very stable and predictable source of income, that may be easy. But for a lot of our clients who apply for aid at a moment of crisis, they may have cyclical employment or gig work. The information may be um, held by a domestic abuser who might be withholding it. They may need help in reporting their information and reading their documents, and they may not be receiving those accommodations. Um, there are dozens of required forms that they have to complete to report, and a lot of that is written at college level for readers um, in CalWORKs that might be difficult to complete. The investigation process is also unfair. Under public benefits rules, clients must cooperate with establishing eligibility. This means they're often interviewed with fraud investigators without Miranda warnings, and they must cooperate in order to continue to receive benefits. The threat of criminal prosecution is sometimes used to get people to admit to, to facts under the promise that they won't be prosecuted, when in fact that information is later used for prosecution. And we know that the consequences go in beyond the person involved, right? We may have kids going into foster care, we have very young families with young children who, after conviction, may have a very difficult time finding employment given a fraud conviction. They may have trouble obtaining new housing, mm -hmm. and it's likely that their immigration status could be impacted. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to cut you off. We, no. we really want to drill down as best we can on to you know, the, the statutes and particularly where we might be helpful one way or another in the penal code. Of course, we understand that the the consequences of, of conviction, especially felony conviction, and we don't take it lightly, truly. Um, Mr. Marta, Martri, is that a? It's Martyr. Martyr, excuse me. Yes, no problem. Go ahead, your five minutes begins now. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, panel discussion. My name is John Martyr. I'm the current president of the California Welfare Fraud Investigators Association, and for over 50 years, my organization has represented those peace officers and non-sworn technicians whose job is throughout each of the 58 counties to investigate allegations of public assistance fraud. Um, we've talked a lot of different things. Um, I'm gonna pare this down just a little bit. You know, one of the things we do with an investigation, the first thing that we need to determine, is there an intentional program violation or did somebody make an inadvertent household error? The penal or the welfare and institution code states that um, welfare fraud, public assistance fraud, is a specific intent crime. 
part of the elements that I have to prove if I'm taking this to court or the, the attorney that has to prove that is that that person specifically intended to defraud the program. That does not mean somebody who made a mistake on an application is going to be processed criminally for welfare fraud. We, we, the we, elements we, aren't there. It we can't go that. No, we will talk, we, I'm curious to talk about that in a second. We okay. understand your specific and general intent. Okay. So, that, so that's one of the things that, that differentiates, uh, you know, am I going to say out of every case that that never happened? You know, maybe somebody got charged with something that they shouldn't have. I'm sure that mistake could have happened. But, but specifically, it has to be a specific intent to commit the welfare fraud. Mr. Chairman, you asked a very important question. You know, how big of a problem is this? And the honest answer is the state of California and the United States U, or U.S. Uh, D, uh, Department of Agriculture has no idea what the fraud rate is on any of these programs. Um, the Cal we have 58 different methodologies of collecting information throughout the state. There is no definitive um, rate of fraud. USDA likes to tout the program has less than 1%. When you look into their methodology, fraud is, uh, is um, defined as those cases successfully prosecuted in a court of law. And very few cases actually go through prosecution. So that is misleading you know, on its own. Um, in terms of to help you, what we need is we need a hybrid. We need to continue with uh, the uh, administrative disqualification process that we have now so that we can divert a majority of the fraud cases to an administrative program and, and um, mostly get those people to make the restitution and pay back the overages that they have incurred through the various um, falsifications that they've made. The other thing is, uh, and I believe the, the uh, district attorney from, uh, from uh, Riverside uh, alluded to, I think it's imperative in this state that we have prosecutory uh, discretion because each county is completely different. Right now, unless it's gone up, Los Angeles County will not even think about criminal prosecution unless the uh, amount is over $15,000. I come from a Northern California small county, we would look at things about $3,000. Our courts are not as um, impacted, uh, you know, with the, with the number of people going to court like LA County is or Riverside County is. So um, I think it's important that this committee in its recommendations understands that we have 58 counties and they do things differently in all 58 counties. And there's different requirements and there's different needs for each of those, um, each of those programs. Lastly, um, I believe that in order to help these people, and I agree with almost everything that uh, my predecessors have said, people applying for aid, it's an emotional time. These programs are very complex. The requirements are very complex, but one component that we have taken out is prevention. We used to require people to watch a video of about three, three minutes in length, how to prevent you from committing fraud. What are your requirements? Now we don't have people coming into the office. We don't have face-to-face -face communication with them. We take their information over a phone um, or an e-application. There's less and less contact. There's less opportunity for our social workers to say, or our um, eligibility workers to say, hey, this is how we're going to help you prevent fraud and dummy that down in a, in a simplified format that you can understand so that when somebody's filling out these forms or they're wondering, hey, do I need to report that or not report that, that that information is available to them. Thank you for heeding the timer. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. No, no, it's, it, uh, this is, now we're getting into the fun part. Um, so uh, again, I appreciate everybody's presentation. I'm just gonna jump in. Um, I do think that on, on a certain level, we're all on the same page here. These are people who are, people who receive these uh, assistance um, are in need and we as a state want to provide the best support that we can. We also want to make sure people aren't stealing. Um, and we don't, and nobody wants to prosecute inadvertent uh, paperwork errors. That's not what we're interested in. Uh, Mr. Chorney, um, 
your presentation began with essentially saying, yeah, but we are prosecuting paperwork errors. I was wondering if you could, and I, and I see Ms. Dozier, you're also nodding your head. And I was wondering if you could, how do we make this differentiation to begin with? So to begin with the idea that you need genuine intent here. And I understand there's a checkbox so you sign something that says, I promise that everything I say will, but um, is there a way, can you explain how intent actually works or in the cases that you've seen and perhaps offer <clears throat> a improvement on that uh, definition that might be used, might be helpful here to get to the heart of the cases that I think we there would be less um, concern about. Yes, so um, you've heard talk of specific intent versus general intent, and I know that you know what that is, so I'm not gonna talk about that. I'm gonna talk about how I see the prosecution trying to prove intent in the cases. The easiest way to prove intent is with a confession from a person who says, yes, I intended to defraud the county by um, not reporting my uh, income from whatever it is that right. put me over the threshold. Um, almost never see that. Can't think of a single case of the dozens that I've handled. So how is the intent proven? It's proven, I think the idea would be is, well, this was so much money that you failed to report and it went on for so long that you must have known that you were committing this fraud because we gave you all this paperwork. We lectured you over and over in writing and we checked in with you multiple times and still you let this go up and up and up without reporting it. That's what I think the prosecution would probably say. I have to say think because these cases don't go to trial in Alameda County. When I bring that to my clients and I say, this is what was going on, what I hear from my clients is, I did report that. I reported it at the kiosk. These are the little robot stations at the social services agency. They look like those places where you pay your parking in a parking garage. And they give you a receipt for reporting that is about as big as a post-it note. And I have had exactly one client who saved her receipt that enabled me to get her case dismissed. Other people, um, they say, not only that maybe I didn't report it, but I didn't know that I had to report it. You've heard talk of this income reporting threshold. Well, big surprise, that's a moving number. I have gotten no, discovered. I, and I, so they don't, they don't know. It's $900 one month, it's $1,100 another month, it's $800 I, the next we, month. We, I, we, I think everybody will agree that this is a very complicated reporting system. Even though, yes. So everybody agrees with that. And I will just say for the public, somebody sending me emails, snail mail, I mean, uh, hard copy emails saying, reminding me to do things is not sufficient notice for me personally. So I understand how that. And of course, there's also the te technical difficulties I'm sure with the kiosk. Ms. Henry, I was wondering if you could address how I how how do you typically prove um, intent? Is it like your like Mr. Short, Mr. Chorney is saying? Okay, we you you watched the video. We called you. We emailed you. We sent you a bunch of letters, and still you failed to report your income. Is, is that generally, or because because your presentation, you really said we want to focus on the bad actors here, the people who are intentionally stealing thousands of dollars from the state. You steal it from a state, you steal it from a grocery store. I think that those are, that makes sense to, for law enforcement to be interested in. But <clears throat> um, how do you, so I'm getting to this intent piece um, because I feel like failing to, you know, answer a letter is not strong enough intent, my initial take on it. Well, I agree with part of what Mr. Chorney said. Sometimes we do have to generate evidence of specific intent in ways other than direct statements from the actual defendants. And it is not a situation where uh, there is, for example, um, maybe one or two instances of failing to report a cyclical income from some side job. It is typically they're working a stable side job 
getting paychecks and any other number of benefits from the side job and over and over and over failing to report the fact that they have another job, failing to report the fact that they're getting any income and affirmatively asserting that they are not getting any other income. Um, uh, um, the part where I disagree with Mr. Chorney is I've seen a number of occasions where people will admit, absolutely admit, that they knew it was wrong, they should have reported it, but they didn't want to lose out on that money. No, I, so that, that seems an obvious place to focus on intent. Um, but... Um, all right, Ms. Dozier, I see you sort of seems like you want to chime in on this. I mean, I think intent is clearer where there are definitive actions, right? It's not just the state of mind of the public benefits recipient, because as Mr. Troni says, you, you kind of have to go into the mind of a public benefits recipient who may think, I am i don't have to report, or I did report, and we know in some of the programs, they're multiple workers. In CalWORKs, they have both their eligibility worker and their welfare-to-work worker, and they may report it to the welfare-to-work worker who doesn't have to take any action. So I think we should focus on instances where it's clear from the actions that there was an intent to defraud, skimming and selling benefits, theft by public benefit staff, scams of impersonation, large fraud schemes. Um, identity theft, right, where they're creating another person who's not eligible for aid and receiving aid on their behalf, or that person's deceased, or incidents where they're receiving aid in multiple counties. Once you start to get into the mind of the recipient, you're also having to weigh that against the sheer complexities of the program, their lives, and the chance that you're, you're getting somebody who truly inadvertently failed to report, and it wasn't um, to, you know, to obtain benefits they weren't entitled. And I, I will go back again to just the very nature of the reporting requirements. They are semi-annually and annually. And given the amount of benefits that people receive, you can hit that thousand, three thousand dollar threshold very quickly, right? Um, and so I, I, focus I, I, on I, actions, not mindset. To present like, you feel like that there's a way that you could focus on the, the worst actors like you, like we were, Ms. Dozier was just saying, say, you know, people who are filing under false names in different counties who are sort of going out of their way to really actively defraud the system. Is that sufficient for you, Ms. Henry? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't hear that you were addressing that to me. Oh, sorry. I apologize. Um, that's exactly what we do in Riverside County, is we use our discretion. It's a case-by-case -case basis based on the facts, based on the statements of the defendants, based on a number of different things, and we make a determination as to whether we believe, number one, that we could prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt in a court of law, and number two, do we think this is the type of case that warrants prosecution? You have written policy as to, you said you sort of dollar thresholds and other circumstances. Do you have written policies around your prosecutions for exercising discretion in welfare fraud cases? Not in welfare fraud cases because we want to make sure that we give prosecutors wide latitude to be able to differentiate between prosecuting um, someone for a theft of, let's say, $4,000 worth of benefits, but then not prosecuting another person who on its face looks like the loss amount is the same. There may be extenuating circumstances that would warrant or justify prosecuting them differently or even not prosecuting them. No, of course, we. I appreciate that, but I'm just, I, I'm presuming that you have charging policies in all sorts in other areas where to help guide prosecutorial discretion. Yes, there are some in specific cases, but in general, it is pretty. It's 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 pretty. Um, it we're given pretty wide discretion in terms of how we file and what we file. Understood. Are there other members of the committee have questions or staff? 
Yeah, I, I wanted to ask a quick question about, about the statements. I think we've heard that come up a few times and obviously a statement where someone says, yes, I intentionally defrauded the county by misreporting my income is, is very compelling. But we heard Ms. Dozier say that sometimes those statements are taken in a way that um, might raise some, some questions. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about that because I can certainly imagine, you know, if you get a package of an investigation, the statements are often summarized in a way that, that might appear that way. Like, how do those statements come about? How often are they sort of spontaneous versus, you know, the product of um, a skilled investigator like Mr. Martyr um, being involved? In in my experience, from the the benefit recipient's perspective, um, a fraud investigation is generated. A fraud investigator will come out. We have had clients. One client testified that she or uh, mentioned that she had recently given birth, and a fraud investigator showed up within days of that, carrying a gun to interview her at her home. She has to cooperate to establish eligibility. People don't know what the links of that uh, that is. They're not given Miranda warnings. She's also, and most benefit recipients are likely very interested in keeping their benefits. They're going to cooperate. Some will say whatever that person who shows up there at their door, they think that that person wants to hear to get out of trouble. Um, and so we have had clients who have, you know, will check a box on the administrative disqualification form saying, yes, I, you know, I, I did this and admit to facts because they think it's the fastest way to resolve the issue, to keep the benefits flowing and to avoid a prosecution because their fear is jail, losing their kids and losing their benefits. And so there is just a power imbalance between an investigator who doesn't have to give Miranda warnings, the person is not entitled to counsel during these interviews, who shows up at your door or who shows up at your neighbor's door and starts asking information and a police investigation. It's just a power imbalance for people who don't know what their rights are and are willing sometimes to say and do what they think that other person on the other end wants to hear in order to um, maintain their benefits. That's not an I want to. I want to just add oh, something oh, oh, to oh. that. Uh, absolutely. I just. I want to honor the folks who raised their hands. So I think Mr. Uh, Marta, Marta, I'm sorry. Martier. <laughs> Martier, Mr. Chorney, and then Ms. Henry. Well, I. I just wanted to counter that, and, I, and I'm not going to say something like that has never happened. Um, but uh, in the um, procedural manual for Department of Social Services. Um, states that no benefits um, can be uh, withheld or delayed um, based on an allegation of welfare fraud as it's being investigated. So I, if you came in and applied and I received a referral to do an investigation and I come to your house, um, you can shut the door in my face. You can tell me that you don't want to talk to me. I, I, there's not, I can't threaten to discontinue your case or take but, away your kids or anything like that. It just as a basic, is there any type of Miranda warning or equivalent that is um, given in these cases? No, the Miranda warning only applies if you're in custody and you're not free to leave. I don't no, have I, to. I, I'm, so very, there, there I'm very familiar warning. with the constitution, constitutional requirements of a Miranda warning, but at the same time, you could pass a statute that says, that investigators need to say the following in order to make sure that everybody's okay. So, but, and, or, or the investigators could do that on their own. But the bottom line is that there is no type of standard warrant explanation. I'm an investigator. You don't have to talk to me. I'm just, you, there's nothing like that. Not, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Mr. Chorney? And um, then Ms. Yeah. I just wanted to echo what Ms. Dozier said, and I just want to make sure that, you know, we're talking about Miranda, we're talking about warnings, but I just want everyone to think about that power imbalance, because that's really important, okay? It, it's, it's, you don't have to say, I'm threatening your benefits. We're, no, we're, to, we're, we're, right? we're, 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 we're dealing with the power, that power dynamic in all sorts of contexts, and we, we understand that completely, and, I, and it's real. I'm not trying to minimize it, but we, we appreciate that when somebody from law enforcement or a law enforcement uh, Jason knocks on your door, that's a real situation for me, for anybody. And, and what I hear in the recorded statements that I listen to is I don't actually hear discussion of the intent, going back to what you were curious about earlier. Instead, what happens is 
did you check this box? Yes. Did you read this on this day? Yes. Is this your signature? Everything is prevent is presented out of order and in a way that can be kind of confusing. And that is the, the statement that that I hear. And so the person just sort of acknowledges, yes, this was me. I did all these things without really being asked to offer an explanation. And really, we only get that once I start talking to that person. No, I understand. I understand. Just Henry, I'm sorry, I cut you off at the beginning, but I didn't want to honor people who had their trying to keep Zoom etiquette alive, despite that we're coming out of, thankfully. I want to say I've heard it's it's common in Riverside County that they do ask for an explanation for any statement. We need context for that you statement. You're saying investig investigators ask for an explanation. Correct. Okay. Absolutely they do because we need context for that statement and our investigators are very much interested in weeding out the mistakes from the intentional actors. So to address your concern about these particular statements, we do try to put them in context and get more information. Got it. Ms. I will just highlight um, what Ms. Henry said, which is in Riverside. I think what you see is you see a wide variation across counties under what they choose to prosecute. Um, and the, the circumstances of that investigation and the decisions by DAs. And so you can basically have the same behavior in you know, three or four different counties with different results, which seems really unfair um, to folks who are on these programs that yes, are administered by counties, but these are state programs. No, I understand that. And I, you know, I think that that's something that we try to balance in all sorts of circumstances where you want to give a certain amount of latitude to each individual county, each individual police officer, as we're talking in the lead, to each individual DA's office. At the same time, you wanna have some consistency throughout the state. So there's um, you know, some matter of consistency. You don't want wildly different consequences for the same. Anyway, we, we, we get that and that's not, that's not unique to this problem. And, Although, and Mike, I might actually weigh in a, a little bit on that, because that was one of the things we looked at uh, when, when, when Rick and I were sort of studying this topic, and we tried to get data on that county variation. It's something we're still exploring. It's not quite ripe yet. And I will say there in some years where some counties have zero uh, convictions for these offenses, and then other counties have a, a lot more. So they're really, I mean, I don't think there are many offenses where you literally see zero uh, convictions from, from county to county. So I think there's something unique um, about this set of circumstances where it's this sort of uh, confluence of this, you know, specific intent to deceive and these issues are, that, you know, Ms. Dozier raised in particular around some of, you know, the, the background of people around these benefits that just um, uh, make it uh, very complex. Um, but it, it, it seems like there's almost too much leeway to some of the discretion issues that we've, we've talked about a little bit. And I think that's some of the, the thing we're, we're hearing about a little bit this morning. Interesting. Is that data that we're trying to collect? I think we're trying to put it into 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 context a, a little bit more because you know the, some of the numbers are, you know, you have some counties where you have eleven convictions. So how what kind of conviction? You know, what kind of conclusion is appropriate to draw on that? Do we want to go back in time? And so it's something we're working on with the California Policy Lab because it seems like a key um, thing to understand about this. And and in that vein, it, it seems like. You know, Riverside County may be one of the counties that that is really has a high standard for prosecution and doesn't prosecute unless it's something done over a long period of time or a high amount. Is there anything that could be done to use that to make that standard more applicable to other places in the state that may have a, a lower prosecution threshold? Um, or is it as as uh, Mr. Martier suggested, is that discretion something that we need to leave in place? Assembly member Brian, I was wondering if you wanted to weigh in there or should we have the panelists to answer the question? Yeah, no, I, th I think that's that's a panelist question. Um, I have a, a separate question. Ms. Henry, I was wondering, that's why I was asking if you had a written policy because it would be very helpful. Seems like you have a thoughtful approach here. And I was wondering if perhaps if you didn't have a written policy or if you, how, do you, how would you address this idea of we want to have some level of consistency and this might be an area of law where there's particular inconsistency, where robbery, you know, there might be more consistency throughout the state, but because of the various factors here, 
there might be very wide disparity. Disparity. I was wondering if there's some way to make some level of cons consistency while maintaining the discretion that you think I'm. So you know, that's a, that's an excellent question. I don't know necessarily that I have an answer to that. I think that um, with any crime including welfare fraud, there are going to be inconsistencies with um, how counties choose to file, what they choose to file, that sort of thing. So that's not something that's unique to welfare fraud. And while we may have filing policies, um, our policies obviously are generated to, or are tailored to um, the importance and the, um, the emphasis that our elected DA places on any particular crime. So I, I, I am, unfortunately, I don't really have a great answer for that. I think it would be extremely difficult to um, create certain policies with regard to welfare fraud because it is a kind of theft. And the only consistent measure we typically have for theft crimes, no matter what they are, is the amount of theft, right. the amount of loss, rather. Right. Senator Member Bryan and then Judge Espinoza. Yeah, I guess what I'm curious is, you know, in Riverside County, uh, or, or if the policy lab has done any data, do you see repeat folks coming through the process? Is there a, a difference in kind of the recidivism impacts of, of of charging of this particular type of crime or prosecution for this particular type of crime? I know at least in Riverside County, we don't necessarily have a really high rate of recidivism. Um, I do know it is true that, and I think probably it's because it, a welfare fraud conviction is not going to preclude you from getting benefits you're not going to stop receiving benefits during the course of a, a criminal prosecution. So I think that once we address the, the fraud with particular individuals, um, we don't necessarily see those same individuals repeating that behavior. Okay, that would be you know counterintuitive to me, right? Because the, the reason I'm on benefits would be because my economic opportunities are not that great and they are certainly not any better having been prosecuted now. Um, and so, so that would, that, that's kind yes, of what I was trying to understand. You have to remember then they, then they probably go on to commit different types of crimes. <laughs> it's not that they necessarily remain crime-free. So I, I mean, should clarify I think, that. I think that also might be something, I know there's a lot of, you know, of a data conversation that I think we need to have around this too, is, is that it, is the prosecution of uh, you know a, what is essentially a crime of poverty, although it is a theft of sh for sure and has implications for taxpayers. But if, if if the argument that you just made actually pans out that that by prosecuting this to this severity, it then leads to something that you could make an argument is a more violent or, or more, exactly. has a greater risk to the public because now their constraints economically or socially have have kind of closed in around them. I think that's there's an argument for public good in, in looking at this with um, a kind of a more nuanced um, approach, understanding those downstream effects. Well, I would also add too that because of the standards that we have for filing these types of crimes, um, we typically see a lot of people who have, who have previously been convicted of crimes now committing this type of crime. So it isn't necessarily always folks who have been crime free, and this is their first uh, dip into the criminal prosecution pool. But we notice the, because the, the threshold, monetary threshold we have is so high, we tend to find that a lot of our defendants have prior records. Judge Espinoza. Hi, let me, oh, I'm unmuted. All right, so my question is for Attorney Chorney, and Attorney Chorney seems to be advocating for the the end of prosecuting these matters criminally, but to, to just simply go with administratively recouping the losses and et cetera. And I, I'm not sure whether I agree or disagree with that notion, but my question for him is, is this a strict felony offense in the penal code? And would he favor 
a wobbler approach to this offense? And if he would, what would be the level at which it would become um, a felony? So um, thanks for the question. Uh, I can be very brief with this answer. Um, if the loss is $950 or below, it's a misdemeanor. If, if it's above $950, it's a felony. And I don't think that making it a straight misdemeanor would help at all, because for misdemeanors, the defendants are still subjected to the criminal legal system, and they are still going to get the same um, treatment. It's just the punishment is a little bit less. And in Alameda County, nobody's getting punished anyway. Nobody is actually going to jail. They're just treated like they're going to jail. And I don't think that it should even be a misdemeanor because what the government wants here is the money back and it can get that 100% through the administrative process. Ms. Bray, we're, we're, we're closing in on the end of our time, but I, I, I do wanna give you a word here, I see your hand. I just wanted to quickly add that that threshold, um, you could reach that threshold based on your household size within one month. So it's important to remember that as long as that rule doesn't fluctuate or change along with the, um, the uh, maximum aid payment rate, then the maximum pay aid payment rate will continue to go up to meet cost of living demands. But then that rate remains the same. So let's say you have a household of four, and I'm just making this up. I haven't been in cash aid since years now. But let's say a household of four gets $1,000, right? So then one month of benefits have already exceeded that amount that Mr. Turney already um, spoke about. So I want to make sure that that's key here too in this discussion. Understood. Understood. Does anybody have from the committee or staff have any last minute or last questions? Or comments. This is a really complicated, interesting area. I think it's particularly um, <clears throat> sensitive or rose to our radar um, because we're necessarily talking about poor people to begin with. I mean, like, right? No, we just begin there. I know a lot of criminal activity begins with people who are um, financially on the lower end of the spectrum, but I think we're particularly sensitive to it because it also disproportionately impacts. Um, particularly women of color, and that's where uh, we began this uh, conversation. So something that we wanted to, to um, make sure that we gave special attention to. I do want to say, however, or in addition, that I think that everybody should be applauded in the system for the decreasing amount of fraud that, uh, that seems to be going on, or at least the de decreasing number of criminal convictions. It seems to predate by a lot uh, COVID. I understand that the COVID regulations have maybe uh, accelerated that decrease, but there seems to be far less prosecutions. Hopefully that means also far less fraud for whatever reason. So, you know, there's good, there's good news there too. Um, <clears throat> with that said, we're gonna take our lunch break. Um, before we do, I wanna just give everybody a brief preview of what we have coming up after lunch. Um, after lunch, we will be talking about uh, criminal fines and fees associated with convictions. Um, and we will have three brief presentations and then uh, a panel. And then after the panel, we will have presentation from uh, Tom about current legislation uh, that is um, from the committee. And of course, we'll have um, public comment. So uh, with that said, thank you all again. Thank you all to our panelists, to staff, to our committee members. We'll reconvene at 1.30, so let's take an hour lunch break. I look forward to seeing everybody back, and thank you again. I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you.